point is, if you die happy, the point is to be happy, no matter what happens to you. The evildoer type is harming people, creating terribly bad karma for themselves, their former and future life, they will really suffer from a Buddhist point of view. They will really suffer. You know, even especially the ones who give the orders, the weirdos who get all hepped up on a battlefield, in a way they're just following orders, they're scared for their own lives, it's, it's unavoidable for them almost, from a Buddhist perspective. But the ones who give the orders to have the people killed or to invade this place or that, they're really the objects of sympathy from the Buddhist point of view. Very much. It's, I know that's strange, but they really are. So to be able to switch one of them, like in the ancient time, Ashoka, the emperor, Indian emperor Ashoka, became the greatest supporter of the Dharma. And he, before his youth, was known as Kala Ashoka, which means cruel Ashoka. He executed many people, and he, he made war and caused tremendous death and destruction. He was really bad news. Very rough type, creating his empire. Then afterwards, he met this monk who wouldn't, wouldn't uh, speak to him while he was on his throne, made him get down off his throne, and like, told him about ethics. And he became the great Ashoka who supported the Dharma in India hugely. And he built thousands of stupas and supported monasteries and also supported people in other religions because Buddhists do that. And so he switched around. So the good karma of switching someone in the power position who's doing wrong is really fantastic, you know. And uh, it's something aimed for totally. So anyway, I wanted to get past this and get past those emotions and come up with the emotion that Everybody can win by be, be, being enlightened. The Dalai Lama, in, as early as 1988, argued and said, and gave speeches in, before parliaments and politicians and things, next century cannot be like the last century. We cannot have these wars. We have to re resolve conflict by dialogue. We, this wars just will not be won. Which, of course, is what Buddha and Jesus have said for thousands of years. You know, violence breeds violence, hatred breeds hatred. Only love can stop hatred, only nonviolence can stop violence. They've been saying this, and somehow we haven't been listening. And, we, and, even, and it looked like we were winning a few things. You know, occasionally we defended some place. We got, and actually, Buddhist ethics allows you to defend a country from invasion, let's say, if you can successfully do it with minimal violence, if you're strong enough. You then defend, then you never seek revenge on the invader. You make a treaty. You don't pursue them into their country, but you know, you ensure that they won't do it again. But if you can't defend, then you should practice nonviolence because, you know, blindly defending and just trying to do some sort of, you know, you know, killing some people without really having the ability to really stop the invasion, you shouldn't do because then there'll be more violence by the invaders, they'll be more angry. And so they're very practical. Buddhist ethics. And Buddhist nonviolence is very sensible. It acknowledges that nonviolent resistance is the most powerful thing, but sometimes violence is minimized by some defense. So it isn't demanding that everybody go out and commit harakiri. Usually, although today, in the 21st century, because of the nature of war, its weapons, its means of communication, the fact that everybody is interconnected in this way, you know, that any conceivable enemy, for example, America, could find we'd have a huge population which would be members of that enemy. And you remember in World War II, the poor Japanese were interned, but they didn't go after the Italians and the Germans. I don't know if you noticed, the Minnesota people were not locked up, nor were the Italians. Of course, they were relying on the Italians for cooking, I guess. The Chinese hadn't got into their restaurant empires yet. I mean, Japanese weren't selling sushi yet. You know, they were just having prosperous farms in California, and they were all arrested and put in Nevada very unfairly. Actually, even some of their sons fought in the war on our side, and they still were in turn. Well, you know, if we had some huge war with anybody, you know, the people population here is numerous of that people, and it would be terrible, as we're seeing, actually, with Islamic population here. Now, in this silly business that we have to, like, fight Islam, have a clash of civilizations. And, of course, that same professor, who, a neocon professor at Harvard, who argued about that, is also saying China is the other clash of civilization. And this is another reason why the Dalai Lama matters. One war that we really don't want is a huge war between all the whites and the yellows, you know, the West and China. That would really, that would, wreck, that would finish wrecking the planet, frankly. There'd be nothing, it would really be terrible because we could never defeat them on the ground, so it would involve nuclear weapons, and they have them too, and it would just be unbearable. And it would be us and the Russians and the Europeans 
and the, uh, against and the Japanese against the Chinese would be just truly, truly awful, and we really can't have that. You know that neocon fantasy really cannot take place. So the Dalai Lama is the one person perfectly positioned to mediate future tension, which will occur after Olympics mania and after this and that. And the Chinese are the starting to buy. They're going to buy the next Bear Stearns collapse. They're going to buy Citigroup. They could buy New York, practically. The 1.5 trillion sovereign fund and growing because of our Walmart habits. And they're going to be able to do that. And then there's not going to be this paternalistic thing from the corporations of, oh, they're so nice. Oh, oh yes, we're going to get their market. So we've got to be really nice and whatever. Ignore their human rights thing. Not at all. There'll be tremendous tension. And the Dalai Lama is beloved, but pretty much by most of our leaders. Of course, they think he's unrealistic and doesn't know what he's doing as far as politics go. But it's nice to have someone like a Gandhi running around saying, let's all be nice, let's talk. You know, as long as he doesn't get in the, get in the way of our war profiteering and our war making and war industries, it's fine that he talks like that. But the Chinese don't know that the Dalai Lama is nice. The Chinese leaders haven't met him. They think he's like a wolf and a, he's upgraded lately to a jackal from a wolf and a demon. And that's ridiculous. Everybody who knows Dalai Lama knows he's like Mr. Cute. <laughs> and when you're with Dalai Lama, you feel good. You know? And he's friendly, actually. And he's just as friendly to your driver and chauffeur and the big person at the hotel to the people who clean the bed and the chambermaids as he is to the owner. He's like a real person. But they call a true man of no rank. And anybody who meets him for any period of time realizes that in his presence. Because his presence gives them space for realization and therefore they realize things in the Dalai Lama's presence. It's like a phenomenon, you know. So he will really matter at that time if, by that time, the Chinese have recognized this and they've made a friend of him, which they can easily do now. Now people, and, and so this basically, that's why I wrote this book. I would go out to a demonstration, people would be out there, free to bed, you know, to solid bed supporters with years of spirits. Then I'd ask them, do you think it will be free? Oh no, never, can't happen. <laughs> China will never leave, etc. This is the concept that's out there, is that it's a hopeless thing. It's a lost cause. Then they say, well, I love Dalai Lama, but he doesn't know politics. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that people are so used to violence determining things, you know, whoever has the most violence, that then is the winner, that the idea that a nonviolent program, like the Dalai Lama's liberation program for Tibet and the Tibetans, if that succeeded, that would threaten the whole world structure, which is all armed to the teeth, you know. There's not enough corn, there's not enough gas and oil, there's not enough education, not enough health care, not enough whatever it is. But there's enough to have everybody have F-15s and bombs and guns and hand grenades and mines, and it's ridiculous, actually. It's a ridiculous waste. Nobody can eat a mine, they can't do anything with it. And then somebody's leg is blown off some child and nobody has the health thing to fix it. I mean, it's time we stop this on this planet. And Dalai Lama is the most important person who has the widest audience, who, who is brave enough to talk to the European Parliament, to tell George Bush after 9-11, I'm sure you'll do the wise thing. You know violence never helps. Of course, not listened to, but he said it. And he does repeat it when he goes and sees like you know, Georgie Portin still is not listening. I think George now might be wishing he had listened, actually. Could be, you know, but of course, he, if he did, he'd be in trouble with Darth Cheney, no doubt. 